High Performance Vet Pro Radio. Welcome to High Performance Vet Pro Radio. Here, you will learn everything you need to know to become a high performance veterinary professional. We will focus on optimizing your sleep, fitness, nutrition, mental performance, stress response, and work life balance. Please enjoy these professional interviews with cutting edge content from Dr. Jennifer Quammen and human performance coach Ryan Smith from HighPerfLiving.com. And welcome back to today's interview. This is Ryan Smith with High Performance Living and High Performance Vet Pro Radio. Today's guest is an internationally recognized expert in the field of nutritional medicine. And he's a key scientist driving the development of nutrient-based psychiatry and medicine. And as the president of the nonprofit Walsh Research Institute near Chicago, Dr. Walsh engages in ongoing research and leads doctor training programs in his advanced drug-free nutrient protocols throughout the world, including the United States, Australia, Norway, and Ireland, and as well as other countries. And you've been doing this for over 30 years, right, Dr. Walsh? Uh, that's right. All right. And so... He really kind of specializes in biochemical treatments, and he's helped patients with that have been diagnosed with behavioral disorders, ADHD, depression, anxiety, bipolar, uh, schizophrenia, as well as Alzheimer's. And he's the author of the book Nutrient Power that describes an evidence-based nutrient therapy system. And Dr. Walsh is with us today on the show to talk about anxiety and depression and that affects our population, but specifically today to talk really, I guess, kind of with me about the veterinary professional population, how we can apply it with the veterinary professionals that are out there. And I've been fortunate enough to be to attend one of Dr. Walsh's symposiums in Chicago uh, recently and was quite eye-opening for us. So uh, kind of that uh, I appreciated Dr. Walsh and I guess really the kind of the thing that I brought you on today and really wanted to have you talk about is the veterinary profession has kind of got this uh, issue that's going on where there is a really, really high depression rate, self-medication, alcoholism rate, and they're ranked as the number three suicide rate among all professions. So we wanted to really kind of break, uh, break this through to them and help them a lot. Um, the last a few months we've actually lost some very very high level veterinary professionals to suicide so um, there's a lot of awareness going on right now so i wanted to kind of really bring some alternatives to the people from normal psychiatric medicine so that's why you're with us today oh that's fine i'll be happy to help in any way i can oh great well i appreciate it so um you know for myself, I'm an exercise physiologist, I'm a nutrition consultant, and I do a lot of things, but then my partner is also a veterinarian, so we've kind of melded this into a health coaching business for, uh, prof uh, for the veterinary professionals. But I want to kind of get, again, a little bit more about why we're having you here, and so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know you have a background in nuclear science and engineering, and how did you kind of move that into brain chemistry, human behavior, and kind of the research that you've been doing? Well, it really all happened by accident. I was a, working as a scientist at Argonne National Laboratory, and uh, while I was living as a very young man living here in the Chicago area, I got interested in volunteering at a local prison, Statesville Penitentiary, one of the toughest prisons in America. And uh, I began this rather naively and just did the usual thing that prison volunteers do. But eventually I started an ex-offender program and got to know the families that had produced a criminal. And to my surprise, I found out that, um, that the parents were saying they knew there was something wrong with their child and different about their child by the time they were two or three years old. And uh, there was a revolution going on in mental health right around that time in which we were learning that depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, and problems like that uh, were really had a lot to do with uh, inborn predispositions and chemical imbalances and neurotransmitters and receptors. And, and so I began to wonder whether the criminals we were working with might have had um, something along that same line. And I started, we started doing uh, chemical testing blood, urine, and hair tissues of uh, criminals, comparing them to normals, and after a while, we found some very significant difference in these people, and one thing led to another, and eventually I, I left my scientific uh, 
nuclear science work and uh, got into uh, biochemistry and brain science, and I've been doing that for about the last 35 years. Wow. So, uh, so it's amazing what sometimes the, the life brings us and makes us change where our work, what we thought we were going to be doing, uh, kind of dramatically shifts everything. So you have the book that's Nutrient Power. I've read it, uh, and I'd read it actually part of it before I attended your symposium and finished it since then. And great book because, I, again, I love everything about nutrition and the whole fitness and health field. But what's the basis of nutrient power for our listeners? Well, I think that uh, for a professional group like veterinarians, um, most professional groups uh, that we studied uh, are more prone to depression and suicidal ideation than most most of the general population. And the reason is that um, that people with high accomplishment, people who are determined, people who have uh, really, really uh, strong will and a desire to do things really well, and I think that includes veterinary, veterinarians, mm-hmm. um, they are prone to low serotonin depression. They're prone to a form of depression that we call undermethylated depression. Um, last May, I gave a paper at the American Psychiatric Association annual meeting, and basically trying to alert them to the fact that depression is not a single disorder but it's really a name given to at least five completely different disorders that involve different neurotransmitter problems. And uh, anyway, one of these five biotypes, the most common one of all, is what we call undermethylated depression. And what's interesting is that these people have a very, very um, interesting set of symptoms and traits that distinguish them. For example, very strong will, uh, history of perfectionism, um, they tend to have a higher libido than others. They, um, they, they are prone to serotonin involving low serotonin activity. Hmm. Uh, they, anyway, they're, they, if they're competitive, if they get into sports or even if they're into uh, bridge or whatever, they, they really want to win. Th- these are generalities. They tend, but they also tend to be more prone to addictions. Hmm. Uh, whether it's smoking or, or cigarettes or, or something more serious. Um, and anyway, uh, there's about 30 of these symptoms and traits that are associated with this particular type of depression. And I'll bet that, um, that maybe 80 or 90 percent of the veterinarians have a tendency for undermethylation. Mm-hmm. And the news, of course, is they tend to be high achievers. Right. They tend to be high achievers and, and, and um, sort of detailed and they are good at making a study of something. Right. Uh, but one of the problems with, with this is that about 20% of all people who have undermethylation uh, have run into trouble. And it's usually, it's usually depression. And very often, anxiety goes with it. And usually it's, it's an unusual kind of anxiety. It's anxiety uh, that most people don't recognize. In other words, it's sort of an internal anxiety behind a calm exterior. And these are the people who might commit suicide, and all their friends will say, well, gee, I never knew this person was depressed at all. It didn't, it didn't show. That's part and parcel of this particular biochemical type. Okay. I can definitely see that in, uh, in a lot of the people that I've dealt with in the, in the profession. Yes, and, and uh, we've now, I've, I've worked with um, about 3,200 cases of depression in collaboration with the doctors I, work, I team with, with and um, we, we find that their chemistry is definitely different than, than the general population. I've got, I think I have the world's biggest chemistry database for depression, and I've been to the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, I believe now four times presenting results of them. Uh, I think this last time was the first time I, people really listened to me. Um, they, they, they have a, they, one of the things is that, that we, we brought to them was the fact that, that not only can we help them select the best medication, whether it's Prozac, Paxil, Serizone, or whatever, uh, with, with our work, um, including blood and urine tests, which identify what kind of depression a person has, uh, not only that, but that uh, there are nutrient therapies that can often correct these problems directly. And a lot of this is based on new brain science. Uh, hmm. Just in the last five or six years, there's, we've learned more about the, the workings of the brain 
the biochemistry and the neurotransmission characteristics uh, than really we probably learned in the previous 30 years. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, that's a, a lot of change in the last few years. And I can imagine going to the APA that there's obviously a lot of resistance to a lot of new things, right? Well, uh, there has been in the past, and, and really the reason, I think, is that they don't, most people just don't believe that if you've got a serious condition like depression or anxiety, they don't believe that, that nutrients have the power to, to really be effective. But the truth is that they do, but you have to be very selective about what you do. In other words, you have to find out what has gone wrong with brain chemistry and then with sort of rifle shot precision um, correct the, the nutrients um, that are either overloaded or dep- in depression. We find that nutrient overloads actually cause more mischief than, than, than deficiencies. So it's not just, you can't help a person by just stuffing them full of vitamins and minerals and amino acids. You have to find out specifically what, what's gone wrong. And we've also learned that uh, although there are 300 or more nutrients in the human body that are important, in the brain, with respect to mental functioning, really there's only about six or seven that dominate uh, neurotransmission and, and, gene, and, 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 and problems like depression and anxiety. And so our focus is on these dominant nutrients. And they're the nutrients that are either um, part of the synthesis of neurotransmitters, the ingredients or, or precursors that you need to make the neurotransmitters, or they're nutrients that have a lot to say about regulation, about, about uh, reuptake of, of neurotransmission. So the good news is we only have to focus really on six or seven key nutrients to, uh, to help people. That's great. So in what we're really not talking about here, I mean, and I guess when most people think about, oh, nutrient therapy, they're talking about, oh, just eating right or just taking a vitamin mineral. And as you said, that's kind of a shotgun approach. This is not the precision rifle shot that that you're going at. This is really identifying and sp- having specific treatments with certain vitamins and minerals, right? That's exactly right. And many times we're dealing with genetics. Uh, some people have genetic tendencies, for example, to be B6 deficient or possibly zinc deficient or, or maybe a genetic tendency for a copper overload. Well, these particular nutrients could have a striking effect on individual neurotransmission. And, um, and that's why I named the book Nutrient Power. Uh, I thought the one message, if there's any message, I want psychiatrists, I want researchers, I want the general public to realize that nutrients can be very powerful in, in combating these mental problems. Hmm. Great. So, so with the genetic part, so in the book, in, in a lot of things that I read about, we're talking epigenetics here. So how does the epigenetics really kind of play into the mental illness? I guess that's the, the copper overloads, the undermethylation, overmethylation, B6 deficiencies. Is that kind of part coming through the genetic? It's, it's partly that, and uh, we've known uh, for really more than 60, 70 years that depression and anxiety runs in families. Uh, the confusion, however, has been that even though there's a strong family tendency for these problems, usually, that, that it, this violates the classic laws of genetics. And, and what we've learned is that um, if a person has a genetic problem, uh, say, with regulation of metal metabolism, that can directly affect GABA, GABA functioning, mm-hmm. which is one of the most important neurotransmitters. It can also affect norepinephrine and, and dopamine. We know that B6 is essential for the, for the synthesis of serotonin and dopamine. And so if a person has a genetic deficiency, a genetic imbalance uh, that results in a person just being low in, in, in B6, you can expect they're going to have mental problems, and they do. Right. So, and, and I know even, and I really was not going to kind of go down this road, but again, with some of this, when we've, and I know you've talked a lot about the school shootings and things that are going on. So it sounds like there's a lot that if we're 
a wrong diagnosis or we are just kind of shotgun approaching that we could end up with some other much deeper issues. And that's where we talked about the suicide, but then even ultimately some of the really bad things that happen like school shootings and stuff that come out of the, I guess the, uh, the psychiatric drugs kind of get a bad rap in that too, right? Well, they get a bad rap, but actually part of it's real. And, and anybody who uh, goes to a pharmacy and get, and fills a prescription for Prozac or Paxil or Serizone or Zoloft or, or any of the antidepressants, on there is a, a little insert sheet that, that tells about possible side effects. And every one of them now says that one of the side effects is that, especially for young males, it may result in homicidal ideation hmm. or, or suicidal ideation or both, depending on the insert. And anyway, so this has been known by the psychiatric profession and the pharmacy profession for a long time. What, what I presented at the APA was that out of these, there are five major different forms of depression that are quite different, and one of them that represents about 20% of all depressives is, are, are, is a group of people who are, have anxiety and depression, but they already have excessive serotonin activity. So what happens is for them, SSRIs make them worse. Uh, now, if they're adults, mostly what usually what happens is these people just stop taking that medication. But if you have like a 14 or 15 or 16-year-old teenager, parents may just insist and demand that they follow the doctor's orders. And I think uh, it's, those are the ones that, that tend to be violent. Wow. And uh, we've now studied the, the, the over the last 20 years, we've studied and there have been several studies of maybe the last 50 school shootings. More than 40 of them involved kids who were okay and didn't have behavior problems until they got diagnosed with depression and were put on an SSRI medication. Wow. And I don't think, I don't think that's a coincidence. Right. So what I told the, the psychiatrists is that I urged them to do blood studies. They could do a lab core blood test, inexpensive blood testing, and, and, and identify the people who should not take SSRIs. Those people do better on benzodiazepine medications. Hmm. They also often can be helped a lot with nutrient therapy. Right. Well, and then, yeah, that's, so that's hugely powerful. How, so I guess really my question then is, obviously these are psychiatric drugs that a lot of them are taking and could be, you know, um, really against what would be the, a good protocol, because obviously we're having these horrible results, how does nutrient therapy compare to pharmaceutical, and how can we change that? And then also, how do we overcome the, I guess, the uh, stigma uh, that nutrient therapy can actually be better than pharmaceuticals? Well, uh, I don't quite portray it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, Right. Psychiatric meds and, and, the, and the antidepressants themselves um, uh, have helped millions of people. I, sure. I've had hundreds of people tell me that, that, that some of these drugs have saved their lives. And right. the problem is that it's, uh, it's not a one-size-fit-all. And because there are different forms of, of depression, um, there are two of the five phenotypes that I, that I described to the psychiatrist in May, uh, two of them actually are ideal for SSRIs. These are people with low serotonin activity, and that's what these, these SSRIs do. They in, increase serotonin activity, activity of serotonin receptors, and that, and that benefits these people, although maybe with some side effects. Mm -hmm. I think what's happening is that um, I believe we're right on the dawn of a new era in psychiatry. From 1900 till about 1965, uh, it was sort of a Freudian approach, and the treatment of choice had to do with uh, putting a patient on a, on a psychiatrist's couch and trying to explore life experiences that might have caused the depression or the anxiety. Mm -hmm. 1965 was a, the, the time of the biochemical revolution in psychiatry, and that came because of the understanding that a lot of this has to do with, with the molecular biology of your brain and chemical imbalances and neurotransmitters and how that works. Um, I believe we're right on the dawn of a new era where brain science has advanced so far, especially with respect to the new areas of methylation disorders and epigenetics, that we're now to the point where um, the researchers have, have, have got so much clarity in, 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 in the functioning of the brain, we can fix a lot of these problems without drugs. And mm -hmm. I think that's the, the new era we're going into. 
I expect 50 years from now that, that we'll be able to normalize the brain without having to resort to foreign molecules like drug medications. Right. Yeah, I, and I would love to see that. I think, you know, we've got, we definitely have a long way to go with, uh, with changing some of the things that happen within our industry, whether it be from the food industry as well as the, uh, the supplement industry and things that are going on there. But I think we can, uh, you know, I would love to see us move more natural than just band-aiding everything in a lot of ways. Yes, and I, I travel around the world with, with our team of doctors, uh, training, training doctors, psychiatrists, uh, and other physicians in, in these therapies. And what I'm learning is that most countries seem to have better diets than we do. Right. A lot of our problem is, is, uh, is, the, is the lousy diets that many Americans have, especially teenagers. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that, and that makes, that, that, that's part of the problem. Right, that uh, sad diet, as we call it, that standard American diet, in which it really is because you know it's everything. Everybody is eating so much processed food, and you know whenever we think about it, I always kind of tell people it's our body is designed as a food processor, not to eat processed food. So getting back to real foods and let's look at it, but you know, and as I learned from your symposium, but that's also not always the way because just eating more vegetables is also not the best thing for everybody as well, right? That's right. Undermethylated people, which I suspect most of your uh, veterinarians are, uh, actually they thrive on a protein diet, mm-hmm. whereas, uh, whereas people with other types of chemistry thrive on a vegetable diet. It's all individual. Biochemical individuality is really everything. Uh, another problem is we, we would love to be able to use nutrient therapies where we just change the person's diet. The problem is for, for mental disorders... Uh, usually the imbalances that are, you know, are are genetic related, and that food processor, our bodies as a food processor that you just mentioned, sometimes that food processor is not working very well, mm-hmm. and so you can wind up with uh, abnormal levels of key nutrients, be, just because of of, of maybe uh, problems that were genetic or ran in your family, mm-hmm. and well, the, the, unfortunately we have to use nutritional supplements. And the reason is that other because a person couldn't eat enough food to get to be able to correct imbalances that are that are that come from genetics. Right. So how so how do really mainstream doctors kind of react to these nutritional biochemical therapies that you utilize and and obviously recommend working with everybody because you have a science behind it and testing behind it so you can kind of really work with it. Um, so how do they re- react to what you're talking about? Well, there's two groups: the people who've never heard of this <clears throat> and, are, and are unfamiliar with it. Uh, just are sort of in disbelief because they don't really understand. Mm-hmm. However, we're getting a lot of tremendous enthusiasm from doctors and especially psychiatrists lately. And this is shown by uh, our program for training doctors that is international. Uh, every time we've gone back to a country, we have more and more and more doctors uh, that want to learn how to do this. The last time I was in Australia, which was back in April, we trained 66 doctors. Wow. And uh, I, I understand that we're going to be back this year, and now about 100 of them are going to come. And, and these are doctors who want to know how to incorporate these therapies into their regular practice. It's really another weapon in their, in their arsenal. Right. Um, a psychiatrist uh, may, may want to use a combination of, of psychiatric meds and our treatment. And what they tell us is that the psych, the psych meds, if they go that way, uh, work better at lower doses, and very often uh, they can they can uh, get uh, eliminate side effects. And sometimes they find out they don't need the drug at all. Right. Uh, getting very popular, uh, and, and I, I see it sort of growing. We've my goal has been to train a, a thousand doctors around the world within five years, and we're we're, we're already up to three hundred, and it's and it's accelerating. So it looks like that's working out well. Great. So where can our veterinarians and for themselves or for their families, where can they get more information uh, about these biochemical treatments, the testing? Uh, how do they kind of follow up and, you know, where do they find a doctor that can help with all this? Well, I think a good, a good first place would be to go to our website, okay. which is www.walshinstitute.org, walshinstitute.org. We're a public charity. Another good place to go would be to the, the book that I did write called Nutrient Power. It's been a bestseller on Amazon uh, off and on in, in complementary medicine. 
Um, and it, it only costs about $15, and you can get it either from our website or from Amazon. And I think that that would be a great way to get started. And both the website and the book give resources. We list doctors who are who have been trained in this, and and there, right now there are we just trained 70 USA doctors this year in this in this method. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. So it's it's definitely taken off. I mean, obviously, with the number of doctors that that are in the United States and around the world, it's it's a very small fraction of them, but it's growing. And obviously, the more aware and you know, as people's ideas change about therapies, and you know, it's not just again, uh, you know, stick a stick a band aid on it. Let's actually find what the root cause is, and let's try to treat it. Then we we have less people kind of in that whole healthcare system because a lot of people are frankly worried about the healthcare system because of all the changes that are coming down the pike, right? So we're trying to find new things. Yes, and and more efficient and and more effective therapies. Right. So in. Uh, so from the some of the testing, like I even went after being at the symposium, I've kind of started working with some of the labs and things that were there at the symposium as well. So people can even contact us; we can help guide them through the through the lab process and find them a doctor, uh, as well as then obviously going through uh, the Walsh Institute. Um, you know, well, we're we're not a clinic uh, right. at this point. We, right. we we train doctors and we give advice and information. Right. But uh, there are la- there's a lab where you can get uh, most of the testing needed to 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 identify the imbalances for depression and anxiety, and it costs somewhere between three and four hundred dollars. So it's not a lot of a lot of cost. Right. So and that's actually it's a very small cost whenever you think about it compared to you know copays and different medications and if you're shotgunning you know medications and you have uh some of these things you know you can save a lot of time and time is money as well right it certainly is and uh we 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 save insurance companies a lot of money the patients that we see uh, usually lead a, need a lot less in terms of things like hospitalizations or, or even doctor's visits or medications uh a natural enemy of ours unfortunately is like is the um pharmaceutical industry right. because um, we the people that that go through our therapies usually uh, uh, need less medication and in some many cases not medication at all right yeah and yeah that would definitely uh, raise some red flags with uh, with the pharmaceutical company I can understand um, so yeah so anything as far as else out there that you would kind of like want to kind of bring about i would eventually like to even get you back on let's talk about some things like autism and schizophrenia and some of the bipolar because i'm sure that even if the individuals in our in our listeners aren't dealing with it i'm sure they've probably got some family members so we might want to talk about that a little further but is there anything else that you kind of wanted to make sure that we covered today no except i i would just urge anyone if they actually do have any severe or significant anxiety and depression uh, I, I would urge them to maybe look into this and maybe get some of the testing done to see whether or not they, they can identify what chemical imbalances are causing their brain not to function as well as it should. Right, absolutely. And, and these are people that are very familiar with lab testing because they use it all the time in their patients, uh, whether they're a large animal or small animal or exotic animal. They're used to doing labs on all these animals, so they know the value of what lab work can do. So this is obviously very low cost uh, from you know determining what could potentially really help them with uh, potential issues. So. I think that's right. I think this kind of science will eventually uh, go into veterinary medicine, too, so that you would be able to recognize from an animal's symptoms what their chemistry problems might be. Mm-hmm. A- absolutely. Yeah. And, and it'll, it'll take some time, but, you know, whenever you're talking with people that are very used to dealing with animals, there's not... There's not going to be any of them that are going to say, oh, well, these animals don't need to eat their natural diet. You know, they're, they can tell the animals that have been fed, you know, uh, diets that are not their norm. And as humans, they should also understand that we need to have that nutrients play a huge part in, in how we feel and how we think and how everything happens as well. So I would think that uh, we can definitely make an impact with them. I think you're right. Yeah. So, uh, well, Dr. Walsh, I really want to thank you uh, for joining us today and providing some great information. I think this really can help some of the veterinary professionals because, again, whenever they're trying to deal with some of these things uh, and they don't know where to go, and actually a lot of them do not want to even see a uh, 
a mental health professional because it can affect their licensing as well. So this could be a way for them to potentially research some things that could uh, could really help them. So I think it provided some great information. I hope to have a continued dialogue so we can really provide more and more as we go along with this. So, so thank you very much for being on. Um, and I want to uh, just thank everybody who's listening for us and for joining us here at High Performance Living and High Performance Vet Pro Radio. We really appreciate it. And if you would, leave us some comments or a rating over on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, wherever you listen to us. You can also head on over to our website, highperfliving.com, and enter your information, contact us from there, as well as all the show notes will be on the blog as well. So until next time, uh, live your life to a higher standard, and have a great week. Thank you for joining us at High Performance Vet Pro Radio. We hope to hear from you soon. Like this episode? Leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. It helps us to reach more veterinary professionals. For more information or to contact us, please visit us at highperfliving.com. Until next time, remember to live every day with intention.